Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Commander, and uh, uh, Ministers, uh, Admiral, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, cadets. It's really a great pleasure and honor to be here today. And I'm joined by the 29 ambassadors of the NATO's uh, North Atlantic Council, and also joined uh, by the representative of North Macedonia, soon to be our 30th uh, member. Each ambassador representing uh, their home nation and every one of those nations standing with uh, Ukraine. And it is really a pleasure to be in this historic uh, city, uh, the capital of the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, earlier today we visited uh, four uh, NATO ships uh, on the harbor and I think they demonstrate the strong support of uh, NATO to Ukraine, to your sovereignty and your territorial integrity. This Maritime Academy can trace its history back 75 uh, years. NATO is not far behind. This year we are celebrating the 70th uh, anniversary of the NATO Alliance. NATO is a powerful idea for like-minded nations uh, that share the same values and interests to stand together in solidarity and uh, friendship. And should the need rise to defend and protect each other on the field of battle. This commitment kept allies free and safe during the Cold War, when NATO and Ukraine found themselves on opposite sides. But 30 years ago, next month, the Berlin Wall fell and change spread throughout Europe. Dictatorships uh, fell and democracy spread. Freedom prevailed over oppression. These shared values have enabled us to develop deep partnerships with our friends around the world, friends like Ukraine, to work together and to support each other. That is why no matter how difficult the challenge, no matter how grave the threat, I am confident that by standing together, friends and partners, we can overcome any challenge. It is now more than five years since uh, Russia illegally annexed Crimea, an integral part of uh, Ukraine. Russia uh, undermined the, so the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And, is, uh, and it undermined decades of work to bring peace and stability to Europe. NATO will never recognize Russia's illegal and illegitimate annexation of Crimea. All NATO allies from Europe and North America are united in their condemnation of Russia's actions. We call on Russia to end its support for the militants in Donbas its cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns. It must withdraw, uh, withdraw troops uh, its force and, its, and its forces from eastern Ukraine and allow OCE monitors full and unhindered access to the whole of Ukraine. I welcome the release uh, of the captured sailors from the three ships of the Ukrainian Navy. They showed great courage and determination in a very difficult situation, demonstrating the true Ukrainian spirit. Their release is a step in the right direction, but Russia must release all Ukrainian citizens, return the captured vessels, allow freedom of navigation, ensure free access to Ukrainian ports in the Sea of Azov, in compliance with its international commitments. And the Minsk agreements must be implemented in full by all parties. The conflict in East has caused more than a million people to flee their homes. <coughs> Sorry. And more than 30,000 Ukrainians have been killed. And the toll continues to rise. This suffering must stop. So I welcome President Zelensky's commitment to a peaceful resolution of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. NATO will continue to support Ukraine's sovereignty 
and territorial integrity. NATO and Ukraine have been close partners for many years. And in the past five years, our partnership has only become closer. NATO supports Ukraine's efforts uh, to reform its defense institutions and its armed forces. Our comprehensive assistance package for Ukraine covers a wide range of different uh, activities. To strengthen democratic control of the armed forces, improve command and control within the military, eradicate corruption in the security and defense sector, and ensure good governance. Combat the constant barrage of cyber attacks, increase military education and training, and encourage the adoption of NATO standards where this academy plays a leading role. We have also increased uh, our support uh, in uh, the Black Sea, including uh, cooperation with your Navy. With greater information sharing, port visits and exercises. I've just had the privilege of being shown around your academy and of a meeting uh, and of meeting some of you. It was very, I was very impressed uh, by the level of cooperation between NATO and Ukraine. By your state-of-the-art equipment, including the dangerous water simulator, as well as the other more traditional facilities, so essential to learning the art of being a modern sailor. NATO provides essential support as requested by the government of Ukraine. And in the last few years, the structure of the academy has been enhanced. Leadership is now thought as a separate subject supported by the US Naval Academy. Poland, Bulgaria, and the United States are helping to create a logistic curriculum. There is a new emphasis on English language training for instructors. And there are now practical internships available aboard Allied ships. NATO is proud to support Ukraine, and we are proud to support this academy. But our partnership is not a one-way street. Ukraine is a strong nation committed to peace and stability around the world. Despite the difficulties Ukraine is experiencing at home, it makes a valuable contribution to NATO missions and operations abroad. Taking part in our training mission in Afghanistan, deploying a heavy engineering unit in Kosovo, contributing to the NATO response force, and preparing uh, to contribute to NATO's training mission in Iraq. In the future, many of you may find yourselves taking part in NATO missions. Your skills, expertise, and courage will be, of valuable, uh, will, will be a valuable contribution to international peace and security. Cadets, your time at the Odessa Maritime Academy is precious. The lessons you learn, the skills you acquire, and the friends you make will last throughout your lifetime in the Ukrainian Navy and abroad. You are the future of this Navy. You are the next generation of Ukrainian leaders. And you are also citizens of a free and democratic Ukraine. It is your right and your responsibility to shape the future of your country. So study hard, train well, and be proud standard bearers for freedom and democracy. Thank you so much for your attention. Your Excellency, thank you very much for your opening remarks. We appreciate that. And uh, l let me, from your permission, to start the, our Q&A session. And from your permission, I would like to start. I will ask you the first question, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, we have a lot of conversation in our Ukrainian society about membership to NATO. 
and the most common question for us is your view. What is your view on the, our uh, perspectives on membership to Monato? And what are the most important challenges which we are facing from your perspective on the way? My view on the question of Ukrainian membership is NATO is the same as the NATO view. Uh, and that is that uh, we made a decision in Bucharest at the NATO summit back in 2008. And I remember very well because I was there as a Norwegian prime minister participating in that NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008. Uh, and there we decided that uh, Ukraine will become a, a member of uh, NATO. And this decision still stands. We have reiterated that decision many times. At the same time, the main focus now is on reforms, is on how can we help you, support you in meeting the NATO standards, uh, strengthening your defense and security institutions, improving what we call interoperability, as a meaning the ability for your forces to work together with our forces, and the fact that we are exercising more together, that we are working more together, uh, that NATO participates in this academy, providing support to this academy, uh, uh, teaching English, all of that is part of moving you forward uh, towards uh, uh, membership uh, of the NATO alliance. So that's the first thing I will say. Uh, the focus on reform, uh, is the best way to move towards membership. The second thing I would say about uh, Ukrainian membership of uh, NATO is that that's the decision, that is a decision for Ukraine and the 29 uh, existing members of the alliance to take. No one else has the right to interfere in such a decision. Because sometimes you get the impression that whether Ukraine uh, should be a member of NATO or not, is for Russia to decide. Russia don't have a say. They, 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 they should not have any, uh, what I say, uh, they don't have any, what I say, legal uh, and, uh, and, and real uh, 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 platform to have any influence over such a decision. Because it is enshrined in documents which also Russia has signed to, for instance, the Nsink, Fine Lack, and many other documents, that it's it's for each and every nation to decide their own path. So every nation has the right to decide uh, what kind of security arrangements they would like to be part of or not be part of. So uh, it's up to Ukraine to decide whether they want to aspire for membership, whether you want to apply for membership. And then it's for the 29 members, soon to be 30 with the North Macedonia, to decide whether you meet the NATO standards and can become a member. Uh, no other country in the world has any right to try to uh, deny uh, Ukraine that uh, right. So, uh, so therefore, I, I am encouraged by uh, the commitment, the, the will, the strength in your efforts uh, to modernize, uh, uh, to, to, to improve uh, your society, to implement reforms. That's good for Ukraine, regardless of membership but it's also important because that's the best way to move towards membership of uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, this is a very long answer to a very short question, but I will add more, one more thing, and that is that uh, NATO's door remains open. We have proven that. Uh, just since over the last two years, uh, we have, uh, also in 2017, Montenegro became uh, uh, a member of NATO, and uh, North Macedonia, will become a member within months. Yes. Thank you, sir. It's absolutely comprehensive answer for that question. And I would like uh, to give opportunity our candidates and here in the audience to ask the questions. So, yeah, I see on the left side, please. Get it of uh, Odessa Military Academy. Sir, I've got such a question. Don't you think that the process of making decisions during the NATO conversations is going for too long, which is making impossible to react quickly on uh, modern dangers which are created by the NATO opponents, as a Russian Federation, actually. So, NATO is an alliance based on consensus. 
so uh, sometimes, also meaning that all allies, all 29 allies, have to agree when we make decisions. You can now have a majority vote da voting down a minority. So if NATO is going to make a decision, for instance, on uh, enlargement or, or uh, a new mission in Afghanistan or uh, somewhere else, uh, uh, we need all 29 allies to agree. The good thing with that is that also small nations uh, and all nations have the same vote, the same uh, 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 as a mandate and, and the same power within uh, the alliance. So, for instance, I myself come from a small NATO ally, Norway. We have the same seat, the same vote as a big NATO ally, the United States, France or Germany, United Kingdom or some of the big uh, nations. So that's the good thing. Of course, the challenge, the problem is that sometimes it's quite difficult to get 29 allies to agree. And I can be honest with you that being Secretary General, sometimes it is a bit frustrating that uh, I have, I don't, it's not enough to have a majority, but I need uh, all 29 to agree. But I think that's the only way, because that's the only way we can have people agreeing to really uh, defending and protecting each other is that we all need to be together and decide and, and, and agree when we make decisions about war, peace, conflict, the use of military force. Uh, then your question was about whether that makes it impossible for us to act quickly. Well, first of all, I think that we have, uh, we have proven before that we can act quickly when needed. For instance, uh, when we for the first and only time in our history, invoked our Article 5 as the Collective Defense Clause, saying that is one, if one ally is attacked, that is regarded as an attack against all, one for all, all for one. Uh, when the U.S. was attacked by a terrorist attack, 9-11-2001, uh, uh, in less than, uh, as in less than uh, 24 hours, we agreed that we were going uh, to invoke Article 5, and that all allies uh, uh, came to assistance and support of the United States. Uh, we also, in a couple of days, were able to agree and make decisions, for instance, related to uh, the air operations uh, over Libya in, back in 2011. And we also have to know that uh, uh, as soon as we make decisions to activate NATO plans, we also have pre-agreement uh, pre or pre-designed plans on how to implement, for instance, military operations. And so current our commanders have a mandate which they can use uh, if there is a need. The last thing I will say is, of course, that um, uh, if there is a need, we can uh, convene the uh, decision-making bodies in NATO immediately. And, and, and what we have seen uh, is that when needed, we are able to make uh, decisions very quickly. Uh, to stand up for our values and our collective defense. Thank you very much. And the next question, you also left side. Yes, please. So, being born in Luhansk is a city at the east which occupied for now I would like to ask, what's the exit of this situation? You, as a more experienced politician, see what you can uh, say about this, how we can uh, deal with this situation, because uh, for five years uh, my parents are still living here and I, uh, I don't see any movements, some changes. So. What is uh, the exit from your point of view? First of all, I would like to say that we fully understand and we stand in solidarity with Ukraine uh, because of uh, the aggressive actions of Russia against Ukraine, annexing Crimea and uh, destabilizing uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, Luhansk, and we know that, uh, and therefore we call on Russia to withdraw all their forces to, to, to stop the destabilizing uh, uh, Luhansk and the rest of Eastern Ukraine. And, uh, and, and, and the reason why we have 
also stepped up and, and, and established a very close and strong partnership between Ukraine and NATO is exactly because of the Russia, Russia's aggressive actions against uh, Ukraine uh, and Eastern uh, Ukraine. So, so when we provide strong political support, practical support, uh, NATO allies provide training for Ukrainian forces, we help you to, with command and control, logistics, cyber, that's exactly what we do to help you deal with the untenable uh, and very difficult situation we see in Luhansk and in the rest of eastern Ukraine. So we support you in trying to deal with that. Second, I strongly believe that the only way to find a sustainable and good solution to the crisis in eastern Ukraine is a political solution. Um, and therefore, we strongly support the Minsk agreements. We think that the Minsk agreements still are the best platform for a solution, but they have to be fully implemented. Uh, and the problem with the Minsk agreements is not in a way the agreements, but it's the lack of implementation. Meaning we need to continue to call for ceasefire, withdrawal of heavy weapons, and full access for the international monitors, the OSE monitors, so they can make sure that the agreement is implemented on the ground. Then having said all that, I understand that people living in Luhansk, uh, in Luhansk and people in uh, uh, Ukraine in general are frustrated because we have been talking about this for years. Uh, there are many years since the, international, also since, since the Minsk agreements were signed and, and I understand that, that, that you feel that this is taking too much time. If there is any comfort, I, I, I can just tell you that sometimes when it seems very dark and very, what should I say, when it looks like there is almost zero progress, suddenly there can be a new momentum and things can really start to change. It's a very diff different situation, but you know, people growing up uh, in Europe during the Cold War, they thought that the Cold War, the division of Europe was going to be there forever, and that the Berlin Wall was going to be there forever. And then in the question of months, uh, the world changed, uh, the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended, and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact was uh, uh, also dissolved. So, in a question of few months, some happened, some, something happened that no one was able to predict. So yes, I understand that, that you would like to see progress. I understand that you are impatient because there has been so little progress. But if we look at the history, uh, uh, it can seem as a kind of very protracted conflict. And then suddenly we are able to create a momentum where change happens. Uh, we have seen that before in Europe, we have seen that before other places in the world, and we need to just continue uh, to uh, uh, keep up the pressure uh, to stand in solidarity with uh, Ukraine. You have to modernize, we have to support you, and then uh, at uh, some stage I'm certain that uh, uh, the occupation of Luhansk and Donbass uh, will end. Thank you very much. And the next question? Give you a bit to the right side. Yeah, here. Neville uh, Kelly Which NATO member, uh, which NATO member nation can be a good example for Ukraine's transformation process to NATO's membership? What are the most important changes happen on the way? Thank you. So, it's very difficult to point at one specific NATO member that can be kind of inspiration or a model for Ukraine because every nation is different, every nation has their own unique history and every nation has their own uh, unique, what should I say, a starting point when they move towards a NATO membership. Having said that, I think that it has to be for some inspiration for Ukraine that countries which we thought not so many decades ago, it was absolutely impossible they were going to be members of NATO. Now are members of NATO. So when, when I was young, you know, for me to just imagine that Poland was going to be a member of NATO, that was absolutely unthinkable. Poland was the, I mean, Warsaw was the country where the Warsaw Pact was established. So, so, so to have Warsaw being the capital in a NATO country was something was absolutely out of uh, question. And then again, 
things changed, and now Warsaw is a committed, strong, you know, Poland is a committed and strong member of NATO. And I remember we had a, we had a NATO summit in Warsaw in 2016, and then we had a NATO meeting in the same room in the presidential palace where the Warsaw Pact was signed. So, so, so I think that that's kind of inspiration for you. Second, I think that so the Warsaw Pact was an alliance of eight countries. Seven of those eight countries are now members of NATO. So Poland, Hungary, uh, uh, Czechu, also both Czechia and, and, uh, and the Czech Republic and Slovakia, uh, Romania, Bulgaria and, uh, and so on. But then three, uh, and the eighth uh, um, country, also the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, and three republics in the Soviet Union, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, former Soviet republics, are now members of NATO. So if anything, I think the fact that you have also been a republic or a part of the Soviet Union, uh, then I think it's uh, some kind of inspiration for you to see that former uh, republics in the Soviet Union are now full committed, highly valued members of uh, NATO. So it is possible, it has happened before, and it can happen uh, uh, again. If there's anything to learn from these countries, then it is that they have really modernized. They have really changed. They have modernized their governance, their public sector, they have been fighting corruption, uh, they, have, they have built truly democratic institutions, uh, and, and the more you are able to do that, the better for the people of Ukraine uh, uh, and also uh, the best tool to move towards full membership. Thank you very much. Last question. Yeah. Here. Neville Kedidi Duke, uh, what does Ukraine need to do to defend its sovereignty and interest at sea? Uh, it needs you. Uh, meaning that it needs uh, uh, excellent cadets uh, and uh, naval officers and uh, a navy uh, that can defend uh, Ukrainian interests at sea. Uh, and that's also the reason why I think that this uh, Naval Academy is so important and what you are uh, doing here, studying, training, is so important uh, for you as individuals but also for Ukraine, because you are the future of the Ukrainian uh, uh, Navy. Uh, then, of course, working together with partners, as, as you do with uh, 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 NATO allies and the partnership uh, with, uh, uh, with, with NATO is also helping and supporting you, but you also support us. This is a two-way street, um, and uh, the fact that we are more, have more exercises, that we share more information, that we more work more closely together is also important for Ukraine, but also for, uh, for NATO. Thank you. So the, from the first row here, yeah, yes. Lady in the red sweater, please. Yeah. Uh, instructor of the Navy Institute, Elizabeth Lysenko. So since you started talking about the personnel, uh, today the Western world talks a lot about the gender equality problem. How is this issue resolved by NATO and the alliance countries? And uh, could you give some advice on how Ukraine can implement NATO experience? Thank you. Of course, the armed forces, uh, the Navy, the, the Army, the, the Air Forces, they have in all NATO allied countries and in Ukraine uh, always been or traditionally been uh, totally male dominated. Uh, but as the technology change, as the societies change, uh, there is less and less reason for that. And therefore, we also see some encouraging signs that uh, uh, of course, it varies between uh, NATO allies, but uh, uh, more and more women are also now uh, being an integral part, an important part of our armed forces. Uh, I think that's important for equal rights, but it's also extremely important for the uh, armed forces. 
Because if you can recruit from not only 50% of the population, but from 100% of the population, you get a much better force. So it is in the interest of our armed forces, the Ukrainian armed forces, the, the Norwegian armed forces, the, the, the NATO forces, that we are able to recruit both men and women. So we often say in NATO that uh, equal rights for women and men is both the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. And that's about partly to overcome prejudice, to, 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 to change attitudes. And, uh, and that's partly about speaking about the importance, just showing uh, um, uh, role models uh, and showing that uh, women can be as important in, uh, in a, at any level in uh, the armed forces, political, military, uh, as, uh, as men. And, and um, when I was Prime Minister in Norway, we actually introduced conscription for women. That was extremely controversial in the beginning. Now it's uh, totally accepted by everyone. And that's a good thing for the armed forces because, because then they get a lot of smart uh, women working in the Norwegian armed forces. So, uh, changing uh, the attitudes, uh, fighting prejudice and uh, developing role models, I think is at least uh, some of the things you can do to try to strengthen the role of women in your armed forces. The smart thing to do and the right thing to do. Thank you. Next question is... Okay, let's go to this side, yes. Uh, cadet of Naval College. Uh, uh, what uh, do NATO countries uh, motivate uh, people to join army and uh, make them uh, be dedicated uh, to this profession? Thank you. Again, of course it varies, but the message is that the, the service has to be meaningful. I think it's absolutely possible to convince young people to join uh, the Navy, to join the Army, as long as we can make sure that what they learn when they train, they learn and train on something which is meaningful. Uh, uh, so to organize the education, to organize the training, to organize the service in a good way, with modern equipment, good te teaching methods, uh, uh, I think is uh, the most important thing we can do to motivate young people uh, to join. And then, as you know better than I, uh, modern navies, it's very much about competence, technology. Uh, so it also acquires or, or, or requires skills and competence, which is highly valued also in the civilian society. And that makes it even more important for the armed forces and the navy to be competitive when it comes to the way you organize uh, the um, the uh, services. Thank you, and unfortunately our time is about to finish, and we have a time just to one question. So, the last row, uh, and the green, yeah, the green camouflage. Yeah. Cadet of Odessa Military Academy, Zilkina. So, uh, how do you think the development of technologies and military warfare will impact future military capabilities? I think we have to understand that uh, the uh, changing, uh, changing and disruptive technologies we are seeing being developed now, they are changing warfare as fundamentally as the Industrial Revolution did in the 18th and 19th uh, century. And I think it's hard to grasp how important it, this is uh, because uh, Artificial intelligence, um, uh, autonomous weapon systems, uh, bioengineering or biotech, uh, and the combination of these different technologies and also cyber, it ha has the potential of totally changing the nature of warfare. And that's extremely challenging especially because we don't have so many standards, international standards, rules, norms for how to deal with that. And also because we see great challenges from countries in the world which are not NATO or NATO partners. NATO has always had a, a technological edge. Our, our defense, our armies, our navies, our 
our you know, defense industry has always been technologically advanced. Precision guard ammunition, uh, uh, command and control, all of that has been uh, areas where NATO has been by far the most advanced uh, defense forces in the world. Now we see, for instance, the rise of China. They are leading in artificial intelligence. They collect much more data for developing, for developing artificial intelligence than, than any other country in the world. Um, and we see new hypersonic uh, 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 missiles or hypersonic glides. We see underwater drones. Uh, we see uh, autonomous systems, uh, systems that can operate without any also, decision from human beings. So this is really, really changing the uh, nature of warfare. And for NATO and for NATO partners as Ukraine, this means at least two things. We need to invest in new technologies to keep the technological edge. And second, we need to look into how we can um, develop norms, standards, in some areas also arms control arrangements. So we make sure that this is uh, a development which is controlled as much as uh, possible. So uh, for me, this is just an argument for working together, NATO allies and partners, because the challenge is so huge. Uh, so it can only be addressed if we stand together and work together as allies and partners. Thank you so much for hosting me. It was great to be here and I'm really impressed uh, by the questions and uh, by this academy. And I wish you all the best and looking forward to seeing you being the leaders of uh, the future uh, Ukrainian uh, Navy. And I'm looking forward to working with you uh, in uh, the future in different NATO missions and operations. So thank you so much. Sir, thank you very much for your time, for your comprehensive answers.